about now. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, four fantastic speakers today for the OLS Week 12 uh, Careers Call, where we look at careers both inside and outside of academia. Um, and I just need to get the right screen up myself, apologies. Okay, right. Um, so we've had an icebreaker question that I know a lot of people have been thinking about and hopefully you've signed in on the roll call in the Google Doc. I can see quite a few of the different names here of people who signed in. Uh, I'm going to skip some of the icebreakers now since we've had a bit of a stalled start this, this, this evening. Um, but some of those answers there to what, what careers you might have answered you would do as a five-year-old are fantastic. So keep them coming if you hadn't, haven't added one yet. Um, so we have a code of conduct, uh, community participation guidelines. This generally means treat one another with the respect that you would like to receive. Uh, and if you witness anything at any point, then uh, you can report this uh, to team at openlifeside.org. And, or if it's something that myself, Mavika, or any of the other OLS co-founders have actually done, then it's okay to just approach one of us directly so that you don't reach all of us, which is where the team address would reach. Uh, hopefully there won't be any need for that. So we have several calls today. Uh, Emmy, can we get you to do the first introduction, please? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so today it's about careers. And, um, we're very uh, lucky and privileged to have our speakers here with us. I uh, have the pleasure to introduce uh, Rachel who is the Research Software Community Manager at the Software Sustainability Institute. Um, I'll let her introduce herself. Thank you so much, Emmy and everybody. Um, sorry, did you say that you prefer us sharing our slides in Chrome or does it matter? If you... uh, sorry, Chrome would be good because you can enable CC in that. I will do that now and share and then move all my windows around. Sorry about that. Okay. Are the captions? Sorry, I haven't. Um... Ah, there we go. Okay, I see that now. Okay, sorry about that. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a career in community building. So my name is Rachel Ainsworth. Um, and like uh, Amy said, I'm the Research Software Community Manager at the Software Sustainability Institute. Um, I had a look through the notes before writing this presentation, and there were a lot of really great kind of questions that the cohort was asked to think about. So I'm going to try and answer some of these throughout my presentation. Um, so my official title is a community manager. And what that means is that I have sort of two major responsibilities for the Software Sustainability Institute. The first is that I project manage the recruitment process of new fellows each year. So that involves doing things like publicity and content creation in order to promote the application call. Um, I also organize the review of applications, shortlisting and selection. And then once we do recruit those fellows, it's then my job to make sure that I can support the fellows with their fellowship plans and their goals. And I also um, facilitate community building and encourage collaboration within the SSI fellows community. And we do this in a few different ways. Um, you know, in normal times, we have in-person events where we get the fellows together so that they can collaborate and meet each other and work on various projects. But um, we also have virtual community calls. Um, we've just started doing these monthly, which is a really great opportunity for the fellows community to network with each other. And then we also write a monthly newsletter to compile all of the fellows activities and really showcase the fellows um, and encourage collaboration between the projects. Um, and just a heads up for this community, we do have the call for applications opening on December 7th. So a lot of you would fit um, into our fellowship program very nicely. So I encourage people to apply. And then my second main uh, major responsibility for the SSI is to project manage their annual three-day unconference series, which is called Collaborations Workshop. And so basically what this means is that I'll chair various meetings such as organizing and steering committee meetings. Um, I'll work to design the program, invite speakers, um, facilitate the call for submissions and other contributions um, from participants and make sure that it's a, a very participant led um, agenda and program. 
Um, I also work on publicity and content creation to uh, encourage people to register, um, attract sponsorship. And then, you know, in pre-COVID times, we, this would also involve organizing things like the venue, catering, travel and accommodation. Um, but now it involves uh, sorting out all of the infrastructure for um, online events. And then of course, there's the uh, documentation of process and reporting and then running the event itself and facilitating um, the, the community interactions within the event and um, kind of making those connections in between participants. And the next collaborations workshop is actually um, in March 2021 and it will be online and registration is now open. Um, but how did I get here? Um, so I have a very typical academic background. My background is in physics and astrophysics. Um, and one of the questions was, you know, how did you decide on your career? And I never actually decided to be a community manager. Um, when I was uh, doing my bachelor's, I wanted to be an astrophysicist and uh, someday work for NASA. Um, but kind of as I progressed in my career, I um, found a lot of pitfalls within the traditional sort of academic and research environment. Um, so I burnt out pretty badly after the end of my first postdoc. Um, and that is when two things happened. The first is that I started looking at alternative careers in tech and attending meetups. And one of these meetups was uh, a community for, for women looking for data roles. Um, and so what ended up happening is I ended up starting um, my own once I moved to Manchester and it's called Her Plus Data. So I really enjoy sort of volunteering in my spare time to, to make connections between people and organize events. So that's just something that kind of happened naturally. But the other thing that happened during this time is I discovered the open science community and it was such, um, the community just really resonated with me and I really loved attending events, um, having virtual calls just like this one um, in the Mozilla Open Leaders community. Um, I was a project lead on round four and then never left. Um, and kind of plugging into this community, making connections, collaborating with other people on various projects just really re-inspired me and really kind of invigorated me to stay within um, the academic environment. Although that's when I started kind of realizing what I enjoyed a bit more than maybe traditional research itself. Um, so then after that, that's when I saw the, um, the advertisement for a community manager position with the Software Sustainability Institute. And it basically was about uh, advocating for openness in research and, and better research practice full time. Uh, so I applied. Um, but how did I get skills in community building? And I, I got most of my skills, if I'm perfectly honest, in this program, in the Mozilla Open Leadership Program. So if you're interested in a career in community building, you have the most inspirational um, cohort leaders who, uh, who are complete pros at, at community uh, building and, and leadership. And so uh, when I was attending the, the Mozilla Open Leadership Program, we learned all about, you know, making sure that your projects and communities were inclusive, about organizing, welcoming events. And these are all things that I've, that I've brought with me into my career. And then because I organized um, community events in my spare time, that was also something that I sort of um, gained skills in. Um, and a lot of what I've learned has been, you know, self-taught or on the job, but now there are programs that are sort of designed to help community managers gain skills. So a resource that I'd like to point you to if you're interested in community building is the Center for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement. And they are a community of practice for community managers. And they also provide resources and training if this is something that you want to pursue a career in. Um, and then the final question that I wanted to answer that was on the list um, in the notes was on a scale of one to 10, um, how much do you enjoy your current work? And I have to answer with an 11 just because I really enjoy making connections with people, um, facilitating events and community calls um, and attending events like this. So um, I will stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Rachel. Oh, sorry, my bell was ringing. Um, do we have, are we waiting till the end to have uh, questions or do we do the individual speakers one by one? Mm. 
one by one. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Any questions regarding community management, um, Korea or, uh, or the SSI for uh, Rachel? You could put them in the chat or um, there is a Q and open Q&A part um, on the agenda as well. There is a question that I just saw. So uh, Rachel, what are the collaboration workshops for and what kind of topics are discussed? Yes, so the collaborations workshops are to bring together pretty much all stakeholders of the research software community. So we're interested in researchers, software developers, funders, policymakers, pretty much if you work with research software in any way, if you're a user or developer, um, what this workshop does is it brings people together to kind of identify and uh, collaborate on solving some of the key issues within this space. Um, our themes for 2021 are fair research software, so how to apply the fair data principles to software, um, as well as diversity and inclusion, like what, how can we address issues such as um, systemic uh, discrimination and accessibility within the research software space to make it more in inclusive and, and attract a more um, diverse uh, more diverse community members and, and be able to retain them. Um, and then we also cover topics on software sustainability. So careers in, in software and research, as well as credit for, for writing software and various things like that. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I can highly recommend it. So I, one of my first events um, as a community manager as well and had a lot, a lot of fun, made a lot, um, met a lot of great people. So highly recommend it. Please check out the link that Rachel posted on the agenda to join. Um, Malvika, oh, unless, do we still have any other questions? Oh, I saw one in the chat, sorry. How easy did you find the shift in Korea and do you still get involved in research as well or are you happy to leave that behind? This is from Kate. Um, so I found the shift really easy. Um, and I think it's because I was doing something that I really enjoy doing. Um, but I do still get involved as re in research as well. And I, and I try to keep a foot in the astrophysical community because that's where I really wanted to shift the culture. Um, so I've actually been invited to join a working group um, on a data um, and software archive for um, a telescope that's about to come online. So I'll be spending a small percentage of my time kind of um, applying uh, uh, open and, and reproducible uh, principles uh, to that working group and kind of waving the open science flag there. That's great to hear. Um, yeah, it's really, really important and valuable work. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions for Rachel? You are more than welcome to put them in the Q&A section of the Google Doc or the chat in Zoom. Okay, in that case, uh, yeah, Malvika, over to you. I'm very excited to welcome Natasha Burt. Uh, I know Natasha for a few years now. I'm a big fan of her work because uh, she also designs everything she does around people and how, how to connect people. She's a very successful computational biologist, uh, done academic work and then startup and then community orientation. So I think there's a lot that I have learned just by watching her. So I'm very excited that she's gonna share her journey with you. Natasha, over to you. Hi, thanks Malvika, and it's so nice to see your face again and some other familiar faces in the audience. Um, yeah, when Malvika asked me to chat to you guys, um, I thought about the path and how convoluted it may have seemed um, from the start to the finish and knowing that it's not the finish so that this is all still a journey. So the way that I thought about it and especially in this um, quite uh, interesting year, sorry, let me first introduce myself. So I'm Natasha, Natasha I'm from could, Cape Town. Could you quickly uh, activate your CC? Oh yes, can you explain to me how to do yeah. that? If you click present. Yeah. Um, and if you hover over your slide, it should show you CC. Oh, there we yeah. go. Caption. Yes. Let's do that. Bottom. Uh, medium. Yep. 
on. There we go. Is that working? I don't see it. Let's allow. There we go. It should be working now. There we yeah. go. Perfect. Sorry. Okay. So, um, yes. Yeah. So my name is Natasha. I'm currently working for Hyrax Biosciences. It is a startup that came from the University of the Western Cape. Hi, Peter. Um, and we were originally working on HIV research. And what happened was that it was during the time that the government um, encouraged people to um, a patent before publishing. So they wanted to generate some, some um, revenue from the publicly funded money going into universities. So we were in a very fortunate position for many reasons. Uh, we were a very um, tight knit group working together. Um, and it was at the right time, at the right, we were right place at the right time to, to do HIV research similar to people doing viral research at the moment during this year. So instead of walking you through my specific career path, uh, because after my PhD, I went into law for a year and I also worked in industry at Roche for a year before going back and doing a postdoc. Um, what I wanted to do, given this um, interesting and quite strange year, was to look at everything that is similar. So the things that are universal to, to my career path. And I kind of like thinking about it um, as this infinity or the circle. So it doesn't matter how much you diverge, you kind of come back to the same points again. And I've have found this very useful this year to look back and um, think about the things that are, have been universal in life. And if I'm still moving towards um, that goal, uh, in, in a career. So in, it doesn't matter what career move you make, whether you're still working in towards this, um, this the same direction. So for me, these things are curiosity. So uh, throughout, whether it's an academia or a startup, I'm very intrinsically driven by curiosity. And this is asking the question, and then, so what comes next? So this has been universal, whether that's it's at a startup or um, in academia. The second thing is learning. Um, and learning is slightly different to curiosity because in the startup specifically, they can be learning um, in things as wide as company structuring in terms of hiring new people, which is, is, is somewhat similar to um, academia where you are managing people. Um, so, so learning uh, for me is specifically also during the times when you feel like you are not um, gaining knowledge necessarily doing the same thing every day if you look very clearly you are always learning and you, if you define it for yourself then you will feel that you're moving forward um, uh, in in wh whatever you're doing and then the next thing is collaboration and this is uh, something that Malvika touched on and it's it's something that um, that that I really enjoy and whether that's in academia trying to work with different research groups or within the startup specifically where we're such a close knit team and we work together on a daily basis and we want to share our work and build a successful company. So collaboration is a really strong one. And, and these are the things that are similar between academia um, and, and, and startups. And then the last one is a positive impact. And with a positive impact, um, this can be from teaching. So when you see students have it, that that aha moment, um, up to users um, of, of a software of your software where they can um, now produce a result for a drug resistance um, result for a patient uh, that they couldn't do before. So so and and also this so these things are the things that I've found that are very similar between academia um, and the startup um, where people often try and um, define the differences and try and say that one is better than the other. Like I've preferred looking back and going um, and looking at the things that are, that are universal for me and, and defining that as the path that I've, I've been following. And I hope that I can keep doing that moving forward. Um, I, it's always um, interesting to, to provide career guidance when I still feel like I'm on the journey myself. But based on that, um, this image is a little more, bit more Escher-like. So even though I've spoken about the spiral and that you keep get, getting back to the same kind of uh, universal theme, it's also, you're, you're allowed to acknowledge that you can change themes and that you can jump between these staircases from time to time. 
Um, and for me, I have recently moved to, with, with the COVID pandemic, our company has gone um, completely distributed. Um, and therefore I have moved to Amsterdam. So, so things have changed for me quite a bit, but in terms of moving to a new country, those themes um, remain the same. The curiosity, the learning about new cultures, um, you know, collaborating and making new connections and then having a positive impact in everything that I do. So with that, I will take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, like for the previous talk, please go ahead and either add your questions on the word doc or in the chat. I'm gonna just quickly have a look. So I, ca I can actually start because um, I think in a way you and I also did sort of a startup. It was a project that we ran and we are quite like invested in it though we are also working full time. Uh, how was your transition uh, from working in academia as a group leader and then moving into becoming one of the founders of the startup? Mm. So this is a... Um, uh, it, it ties in with um, the question of um, how, from on a scale of one to 10, how much you would enjoy your job. Um, it's similar to, to answering the question on how's the transition from academia to a startup or from a group, group leader to being part of a, a, a team. Um, and it's, again, it goes up and down for all of us. So there are some decisions that are easy that we feel that we feel um, uh, you know, we're contributing, um, we're making a positive impact from a day to day. And then there are some times where it's, uh, where it's a lot harder. So the transition from academia to the startup was very easy, but on a day to day basis, there are new challenges that you, that you face um, every day. And some weeks are, some weeks are uh, phenomenal and then some weeks are very challenging. And I think that's part of the journey. I'm not seeing any more question, uh, but I'm going to ask another one, which is about knowing what you know now. Uh, what would you wish that you had known while you were working in um, academic institution and uh, probably not explicitly preparing to bring your knowledge to the startup situation? So if people in the crowd are planning the same or are not sure yet, what would you advise them? So the one thing that I, I did well was um, to tell myself after the PhD, after my PhD, that you, you have time, you have time to go and explore um, if, if something else will work. And I still tell myself that it's like you have time, it, you don't have to know everything right now. Um, you can always go back. Research doesn't move as quickly as, as you imagine it is going to move if you're out of um, academia for a year or two, and the same other way around. You will always have the opportunity to go back. So, so I wish I told myself not to worry as much. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, I'm gonna move on, but just so you all know, there would be a big panel at the end. Natasha might, might not be, in the full panel, but uh, Natasha has left email and Twitter uh, to get contacted. So I'll leave it to you. Okay, folks, um, I just realized that because we're running late, uh, Andrew, are you still okay to present? I know you said you had to leave at six and I'm just- Oh, it's okay. I just, I, I can, I, yeah, I'm fine. I can smell nice cooking smells coming from the kitchen. So during my talk, you might actually hear my stomach rumbling uh, for which I apologize. <laughs> Okay, well, in that case, uh, I would love to introduce um, Andrew, who apparently still can present, and I'm very glad for that. Um, he's also a Software Sustainability Fellow, and he is actually our uh, academic representative today. Um, so, Andrew, I'll let you tell people what you do. Uh, you'll say it better than me. Yeah, thanks very much. So, I, I don't have any slides, actually, so I wonder if maybe you or Milvika, if you share your screen, uh, whether the transcript um, will come up. 
Um, hopefully it can cope uh, with my accent all right. Um, well, it's not, that's not too bad. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. Um, so yeah, so I'm an, I'm an experimental psychologist by training. Uh, I've been at the University of Manchester for around 17 years now. Uh, and this was actually after I spent um, about three years working in industry and uh, doing a couple of postdocs. So I've kind of you know shifted around a little bit over the last few years. Uh, and I think talking about academia today and, and this you know brief overview of my view of academia today is probably quite different from what my view would have been uh, just just you know three or four years or so ago. Um, I'm currently senior lecturer in the Division of Neuroscience and Experimental Psychology. And I guess within the UK, there's always been a sort of uh, difference between universities in terms of their focus on teaching uh, and research. Uh, and I've noticed over the last few years, actually, there's a particular shift in terms of universities' engagement with open research practices. Um, at one end of the spectrum, you've got universities such as Utrecht and UCL, who are very much, and, and a few others who are very much leading the way in terms of open research and uh, adopting open research position statements. Where on the other end of the extreme, you've got many universities who, uh, you know, think that open research means no more than open access publications. And so it's interesting seeing universities at different stages. Of, of this journey. And that's one of the biggest distinctions that I see between universities um, at the moment. Um, and one thing I should say, if you're interested in uh, staying within academia, if you end up in a more research focused university that hasn't yet engaged with open research or hasn't yet uh, adopted an open research position statement, it's actually a great opportunity to shape it. And you can put your open leadership skills that you've developed uh, on this course into practice. So you can kind of educate others about what openness means to you uh, and have that broader discourse. Uh, and one of the challenges I think is also having conversations with people in very different disciplines. Um, in a couple of weeks time, I'm giving a talk to uh, colleagues that will include uh, people with backgrounds in humanities research. So again, it's just understanding uh, kind of the language that they use that actually describes the same things that you're interested in, but just their differences in terminology. Um, if you end up in a more teaching focused institution, it's a great opportunity as well uh, to teach open and reproducible skills to students. Um, within the UK, it's interesting seeing that many undergraduates are now starting university, uh, having actually had practice coding in uh, Python and Scratch at school. Uh, my daughter learned um, how to code uh, in Scratch when she was about six or seven years old. So, uh, you know, these foundational skills, uh, you know, students are now coming into university with. Um, I guess within the context of my own experiences, uh, the, the different talk that I would have given four or five years ago, I would probably have reflected my disillusionment with academia as much as anything else. Uh, you know, as I'm sure people can attest to, academia was is certainly uh, was and still is highly competitive. Uh, some universities really focus on big grants and papers in high impact journals rather than doing robust and reproducible science. So out of, out of my disillusionment, that kind of uh, encouraged me to engage with the broader open research uh, and reproducibility conversations that were going on on Twitter um, at the time, you know, two or three years ago. Uh, and coincidentally, that coinc that occurred when the um, UK Reproducibility Network was founded. So the UK Reproducibility Network, founded by Marcus Munafu at uh, Bristol University, is focused on encouraging universities within the UK to do uh, more reproducible research, uh, adopt more open practices. Um, and as a function of the UKRN developing, um, along with colleagues at Manchester, uh, and Rachel was one of them actually, we, we found that the open research working group, uh, which is a grassroots uh, working group within academia at Manchester that crosses disciplines. We've got, you know, I'm a psychologist, we've got computer scientists, we've got biologists, uh, we've got biostatisticians, um, we've got people in the social sciences as well. Um, and I think that's one of the really important things to do is actually to build a community that crosses those traditional academic disciplines. Uh, and one thing that was very useful about the open research working group activity that we're all engaged in is it really raised the profile of open research and reproducibility within the university. 
uh, the university knew that they needed to do more to promote open and reproducible research practices, but they didn't know how to do it. Um, so the VP for research at Manchester has been hugely supportive of what we've been doing, because in a sense, we're doing the hard work. We're actually getting the, the community uh, started. We're getting the conversations going. Uh, so I, I now sit on the university level open research strategy group, um, because up until you know when I joined, the group had mainly focused uh, on open access side of things because they weren't, they weren't really sure what open research was uh, apart from that. So I think finding your community is really important or creating a new community within your academic environment is important as well. Um, and one thing that's critical, no matter what career stage you're at, is try to find some senior academics in your home institution who'll effectively be vocal supporters for you and introduce you to people. Um, I had a lot of luck at Manchester um, because I discovered the SSI, the Software Sustainability Institute, has been transformative uh, for both my career and my mental well-being, I have to say. Uh, so meeting people in the context of the SSI has been fantastic. And having, uh, you know, somebody like Carol Goebel, uh, somebody to go and talk to uh, and ask for advice is just fantastic as well, because Carol is just a hugely important, influential and wonderful uh, mentor to have. Uh, and just as these more senior academics will amplify your voice, it's always important to remember that you can amplify the voice of others in your community and you should do that because there are always voices that we can we can amplify because of our uh, positions uh, that, that, that we're in. Um, so just to finish off, I really want you to kind of recognize the fact that you've all got a very unique skill set. Uh, you've got discipline specific knowledge, as well as knowledge about the kind of computational tools needed for openness and reproducibility. And actually not many people have these skills and certainly not many senior academics have these skills either. Uh, so in academia, showing that you're somebody who can actually solve problems in new ways uh, and do, where those solutions align with your own goals and values is really powerful ability to demonstrate. Uh, and you could end up being, you know, almost the go-to collaborator for other academics wanting to adopt open and reproducible practices. So my final two points I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make, um, and this probably applies outside academia as well, uh, be aware of institutional politics uh, but try not to get involved uh, if, you, if you can help it. Uh, and the other thing to really say, it's at the end of the day, it's just a job uh, and make sure that you've got life and interests outside of your work. Okay, happy to take questions, obviously. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, just a quick check, Malvika, is the otter still working? Otter is working. I'm gonna reshare the link uh, again with uh, just to make sure that folks who need it can access. I was slightly worried I'd broken it there. <laughs> uh, I... Anybody's name right, so. <laughs> No, I was very pleased with how well it did with your accent, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it's also really nice to hear that um, even when there have been troughs, that there have been ups that have come as well. Uh, so does anyone have questions for Andrew at this point? Um, it's also okay to unmute your microphone um, or to write them in the um, chat or in the Google Doc. Um, I have a question, if that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Andrew, it's Kendra. Andrew hi, Kendra. Is my mentor, so. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have a question about hiring practices. Um, do you see them changing now or in the near future regarding like how hiring committees see open science activities? Yeah, really good question. Uh, yes, I, th I think things are already changing actually. So within the UK, um, I've seen recent advertisements from the University of Glasgow and Keel University uh, requiring all applicants to provide a statement as to how they uh, have adopted to open research practices in their own uh, research areas. Um, and it's something that I'm trying to do at Manchester as well, um, because I think universities realize that this um, 
treadmill that academics have been on for the last couple of decades really isn't leading anywhere other than in terms of sort of you know stress and and burnout. Uh, and um, in, in 2015, Wellcome Trust, one of the major uh, funders in the UK, um, organised an event to discuss the fact that about half of all journal articles simply can't be replicated. So about half of all journal articles in biomedical and life sciences uh, are just wrong. And funders realise that they don't want to be funding research that's going to turn out to be wrong. So funders have really uh, led the way, actually, in terms of requiring applicants for funding to uh, adopt open and reproducible practices in their own research. Uh, and universities uh, are starting to uh, you know, re require that as well, actually, because obviously research costs money. And certainly in these times, universities don't want to be spending on money, money on research that's, you know, 50% of the time is going to turn out to be incorrect. So I think things are changing and they have changed a lot, even in just the last couple of years. Um, and I can see, you know, those changes only accelerating. That is really inspiring, actually, and really encouraging, I think, for many of us to hear that open science isn't like extra salt that we sprinkle on afterwards because we care, that actually other people might care as well. <laughs> yeah, very much so, definitely. Amazing. Um, so we have another question from Emma. Uh, thanks, Andrew. That was great. Can you make a comment about how you think REF will change to reflect broader academic outputs from open science work? Uh, fantastic question. So um, I did the test, but I'm also the ref lead at the University of Manchester for UI4, which is psychology, psychiatry and neuroscience. And I was at a meeting, a ref meeting down in London, it was either a year ago or two years ago, my sense of time has just gone out the window recently. Uh, but it was a ref meeting in London, where uh, the chair of the UI4 panel actually explicitly said they would, uh, they will welcome, uh, they will encourage and they will reward uh, engagement with all aspects of open research. Um, and that was just amazing to me because I don't think of uh, organizations like REF as moving particularly quickly. Um, and my understanding is that the next REF will only have more of this in it with a more uh, emphasis placed on the importance of the research environment within institutions. Uh, and less importance actually placed on outputs and high impact journals. So I think REF is really going to be looking at that broader research culture. And I just think that's fantastic news for all of us. That is also what we like to hear. Um, and thank you, Malvika. She realized that perhaps people who are recording not from the UK might not be familiar with REF. Um, and that actually, basically, it, it's the way that academics are measured in the UK is, is the shortest way to sum that up. There's a lot more complexity than that. <laughs> um, I think we will move on to our next speaker. Uh, so thank you very much, Andrew. It's been delightful. And hopefully we didn't actually hear any tummy, tummy rumbles. <laughs> so <laughs> well, <that's> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you can go and enjoy your dinner. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, take All right, care. thank you. Um, so the next speaker is actually uh, my colleague Ekin. Uh, so I realized while we were talking that I myself have been through a career transition because when we did OLS1, I was um, working in academia and I now work for a funder. And so we're very lucky to have Ekin today. She's going to talk about the transition again from working from acad academia and now working more in the funding level. Um, Ekin, uh, over to you. Hi everyone. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to share my screen. Is that working? Perfectly. Okay, excellent. Okay. Hi everyone, and yo, thank you so much for this in introduction. So my name is Ekin Berukpashi and I work uh, as research funder for Welcome Trust. So um, this is not what I have always done in my career path. And I would like to start by giving you a quick overview of um, how actually um, I, like how my career path has unfolded like over the past almost 15 years. And I also would like to share with you perhaps top three highlights over this path, as well as my top three mistakes, because I, I think they're also important. And I really hope that these may somehow inspire some ideas and uh, trigger questions that we can hopefully discuss later on. Um, during the Q&A session. 
So I spent my, the majority of my career in academic research and in so-called uh, the wet lab settings. Um, I graduated from my undergrad in genetics at the University of Edinburgh. And at that point in my life, I was very much into cells and, uh, and you know, uh, genetics and basically model organisms. So everything had to matter at a microscopic level. So uh, with all this love for genetics and cells, I ended up by getting a PhD in cellular biology and more specifically, I worked on insulin signaling pathway in fr fruit fly Drosophila. And then pretty much right after I graduated from my PhD, I started a postdoc at U University College London and I still wanted to keep my beloved model organism, uh, Drosophila and my signaling pathway, uh, but I started getting more interested in the effect at an organismal level and overpopulation. So my postdoc research focused on the effect of insulin on aging and lifespan control in Drosophila. And I guess my focus somehow upgraded from the macro level to a macro level because I was then looking at um, longevity in populations. Uh, but I, I remember that at some point throughout my postdoc, I realized that if I was to stay in academia, then that one specific question was probably going to be what I was going to build the rest of my career upon. And it would be very difficult to pivot significantly uh, down the line. And somehow that really didn't sit well with me and with my personality. I really missed having a broader overview over research landscape and having the flexibility to change interest significantly um, whenever I, uh, you know, I, I, my, uh, I, I, fe I felt that it was needed. And since I was also working at the very much discovery end of things, the impact of the outputs was very hard to observe, which also kind of somehow demotivate, demotivated me. So then I thought uh, about what I needed to change. So I wanted to have a job which allowed me to have a broader review over biomedical research, shorter timeline to impact, and also something with the people factor that enabled me to network and, and engage and, uh, and basically interact with people. So I applied for a job as portfolio manager at Wellcome, uh, which I was then offered. And I changed my career probably after 10 years in academic research. And, uh, and actually, I also very much recently changed my job from portfolio manager and I, I started working as a data challenges manager with uh, in the same team as you. Um, so uh, somehow even within the research funding landscape, my job very much recently changed. So as part of my current job, I keep a strategic overview of the global health research landscape and with main, my main focus being the health data. I look out for opportunities to advance Wellcome's mission as a funder. And also I create networks, I engage with the research community and other uh, research funding uh, stakeholders. I build partnerships, I enable platforms to improve health globally. And overall, I have to say it is actually um, quite exciting. <laughs> um, so then I guess that, uh, oh, okay. Maybe like one thing I have to add at that point is, um, the kind of somehow the power dynamics I was involved in changed quite a lot as well ever since I shifted from being a researcher and I started working for a funder. In a way I was at this end of the spectrum where I was constantly asking for money to fund my research and now I, I became part of this organization where this kind of decisions are made and if I'm fully honest I do actually really enjoy this change in dynamics. <laughs> Um, it, is a, it is an easier place to be, you know, in all honesty. Um, okay, so then when I thought about three highlights from the past 15 years, I think it is really important to acknowledge this intellectual freedom and space for curiosity that academic research has enabled me. I think, I think that's, that's really, that's a, that's, that's a phenomenal opportunity, I have to say. Um, and similarly, this kind of analytical skills that one acquires while doing research are so transferable. And I think at that time, I was totally underestimating it. But the day that you end up at a kind of a normal business meeting with people and you can use these skills and back up your arguments in a similar way that you would back up your uh, scientific hypothesis with data, you realize that it's actually very transferable and it's actually quite cool to see that. Um, and I think um, the highlight of being a research funder is this ability to influ influence the wider landscape. And that also happens even at a quite junior level. You don't have to be the director of something. Um, and it is nice to see this, this short timeline to impact about something that you really care about. 
And three things I wish I had done diff differently. I really wish I had had a less linear career path in academic research in a way I went from one PA, like from finishing the PhD right into a postdoc. Like, you know, it seemed like everything had to happen uh, pretty quickly. And I think that was a mistake. I think I should have really had a much more outward facing approach to things. Um, and the second thing is, I think it is okay to be picky. Like if someone offers you a interesting job in a good lab, it doesn't mean that you have to take it. You need to think about it in the wider context of um, career progression because it is important. And also uh, finally, when I was an academic researcher, I really wish I had done more investment into secondary skills. And I had thought a little bit broader than just you know, getting my research done, getting my papers published. I think it would have really helped me. Okay, so I am going to stop here and um, thank you for listening. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Ekin. Uh, so as before, uh, folks, feel free to either add questions in the Google Doc, uh, which is why I'm looking over there. It's my second screen. It's not that I don't want to look at you while I'm talking to you. Uh, or um, you can add them in chat, or it's also okay to unmute if you have a question you'd like to ask. If not, Ekin, I have a question, actually. Uh, so um, you talked about the, uh, the non-linear aspect and also about investing in secondary skills. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on what those are. Of course. I mean, I think um, somehow at the time, um, it just felt like everything had to, like every single career steps uh, had to happen, especially within academia, one after the other. Like I somehow, and actually I don't even know where this pressure was coming from, probably self-imposed, but I felt that the moment I finished my undergrad, then I had to get a PhD. I had to start a PhD right away because that's what I wanted to do. Similarly, the moment I finished my PhD, I felt that I had to figure out my next step as a postdoctoral researcher right away. And I think this is really a shame. And actually the whole investing into secondary um, skills fits very much within the same you know, idea. I really wish I had taken my time, perhaps taking some time out and done other things, which might not be directly kind of academic research related, but you know, other some sort of I don't know. I wish I wish I had done um, some some degree in maybe uh, maybe teaching because or maybe in mentorship. Like it would have helped me at so many different um, kind of aspects in any kind of career, really. So yeah, I guess like the whole point is. And I, it's quite interesting because when I was listening to Natasha speaking before, she, she said the same thing, but it seems like she'd taken the other approach. And I think that is the right approach. There is always time. It is always good to just, you know, look at it outside, you know, figure out what might be quite um, interesting um, on a very personal level. Um, and then, you know, properly spend time in, in kind of nurturing these skills. So. I find that really interesting personally, actually. Um, also like partly re reflecting on my own career because by the time I graduate with my PhD, I probably be, will be nearly 40. So I've definitely taken my time on the way. <laughs> and I think it's the right way of doing it. I mean, I have to say even um, kind of taking time and exploring different options would have properly, probably even enabled me to make different choices in terms of the research that I was investigating. I think perhaps overall, I would have ended up where I am right now, but it's not just the end point, it's also the journey that matters, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, are there any more questions anyone want to throw in there? David, was that um, like a scratching your head? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, it's always those awkward moments where it's like, no, I was just, I just happened to be moving. Um, Awesome. And Georgia says she finds that really encouraging. So thank you so much, Ekin. <laughs> um, so I think, Emmy, would you like to introduce our next, our, our next speaker? Definitely. Uh, yeah, my pleasure to be introducing David. Um, 
first heard your talk at CSB Conf this year. Huge admirer of your work. I'll let you get on and introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm going to try to share my screen. Let me know if you can see it and whether the CC is working. Yeah, the CC is okay. working. You can Great. See. All right. Thanks, everyone. And I'm really excited to, to hear from, from the speakers. I think they've done most of the work <laughs> for me. All I'm going to do is take, take a, a little shift and just highlight some things that I have come across that have been essential in my journey. So I am supposed to be speaking on social entrepreneurship, um, but that is quite difficult to give specific tips ar around how you get there. Um, but I hope in sharing my journey, you'll be able to do some things that'll be relevant for you. Um, so my journey started out in Ghana. I lived there for 17 years and I highlight um, the things I was exposed to because some people may not necessarily have this background. I grew up in a lower middle-class family, Christian farming fam family. And then I had the opportunity of spending two years in Costa Rica through a scholarship, um, which really changed my life and my perspective um, at that age, being in on a campus with students from over 60 different countries. It's just life altering. Um, after that, went to the US where I did my undergrad in biology and had my master's in computer science. And at that point, I was very much interested in bioinformatics research, and that was the trajectory in which I thought I was going. Um, then life happened uh, because of a regulation which involved the visa that I had. I could stay in the US as long as I wanted, but all the jobs that I got, I couldn't take them because now my employment authorization was taken away. So it was either I stay in the US and just be there, or I find something else to do. And um, an opportunity opened up for me to come back home to Ghana. And I took that. I came to work um, at a tech incubator where we were helping um, startups build their companies from Nigeria, Ghana, and Kenya. And that was an opportunity to also become a local open data advocate or leader because a lot of these companies were not necessarily thinking about the power of data and, and open data became the avenue to really leverage on these skills. Um, I quickly became known as a, the open data person <laughs> um, and that opened opportunities for me to work um, for the next four years after that um, with first open knowledge um, foundation, which is based in the UK working remotely, um, supporting other organizations journalists, civil society organizations, governments, and really thinking about how they can make data sets open uh, for, for different purposes. The experience through that has allowed me to work across 30 different countries in five continents. Um, and, and the power of that, interestingly, is not in the technical skills. They are relevant um, from computer science and, and biology but it has been the understanding of people, the ability to connect with people and the problems that they're solving and how to kind of sit with them on whatever journey they have and then be able to work backwards and see what tools and, and skills you can provide to, to them to enable them to get to their destination. Um, last year, I decided to leave my job um, to become a farmer. Yes. Um, and... It is because I think looking at my career trajectory, my job or the jobs I've had have always been pointing to one thing. Um, how do I help enable people become better at what they are good at? Um, and I think from working all across these jobs, some of the things that stood out to me was that in particularly resource constraint environments, you have very talented people dealing with very difficult challenges and all they need to to have is for people to point out what specific tools or processes they can have access to for them to get along their journey. And for me growing up in a fam farming family, I saw an opportunity to help smallholder farmers really leverage on some of the skills that I have to really make their lives much better. So that is what I'm currently working on. And also 10% of my time is helping other startups really figure out how they can leverage on data um, to, to solve problems. So one of the startups is trying to figure out how to develop simple tools to make migrant workers 
um, have better financial um, literacy. And another one is building educational platforms that can educate um, African children. Um, just quickly, what is Growing Gold Farms working on? We are working on four things, solving four problems. We want to figure out ways to consistently produce healthy and affordable food using sustainable and accessible practices. Um, then we want to build capacity of other farms and farmers to, to do so sustainably too, so transfer these skills on a broader distributor level. And then another challenge that a lot of smallholder farmers have is that they usually produce either one crop um, depending on, on the weather. So can we think of ways to diversify that, but also move the raw materials to um, processed forms? And then finally, make farms spaces of attraction, innovation, recreation, and fun. Um, there are very technical problems that we need to solve all across this, which will leverage on computation, economics, anthropology. And I think that's what makes it exciting as a, a, a social entrepreneur, if I can call myself that now. Um, on a typical day, I am reading about and implementing research to these problems that I've listed out, so reading papers around um, geolocation and how can you figure out um, the constituents of soil um, in order to determine what crops can grow around that without having access to internet. So these are very interesting problems to be really thinking through. Um, I think the most powerful thing, putting together uh, and enabling the team of people, you can solve this alone. So how do you sell that vision to people and, and allow that team to have the capacity to really solve the problem with? And then believing in ourselves. It's, you get to points where nobody else believes in you, but you believe in yourself as a team and you keep on working at it and you get encouraged and, and you keep on going because at the core, you believe that you're solving something at least for yourself and, and other people. I'm just gonna quickly go through some, what I call career anecdotes. Um, these are just my own musings. Be versatile, that's one thing I've learned. Um, one of the things that have been important for me is to initially generalize, be able to have some understanding of a broad set of different things. So if you're a research person, still understand how to communicate with people, still understand how to facilitate, how to even do comedy if you want, just, just be versatile. At the same time to have one thing that you're known for. For me, is the ability to take complex things and simplify it for other people to, to, to have and to be able to use. Um, see people. Um, and let people see you. And what do I mean by that? It is so easy to get bogged down in technical things and research um, and miss people or focus on the job. Those are all relevant. But I think when you see people in all the jobs I've done, I've had at least one person that I still stay in touch with or who knew me for more than what I was able to do as part of my role. Um, so they could either come talk to me bounce ideas off me, knew about my passions outside of work. And even if you find um, employers that really care about that, that is actually much more powerful. And also let people see, especially people who are from um, um, backgrounds that are not necessarily um, predominant in whatever space that you're working in. Um, make sure that you create opportunities for yourself to be seen, speak. Um, and I know sometimes it can be difficult, but speak participate in events, um, try as much as possible for people to also know that you are more than just your title. And this is kind of like a joke, um, ground your identity in your job. No, do not do that. Do not ground your identity in your job. Um, your job will go away, it will disappear. It lets your identity be much more than that so that when your job changes, when you wanna do something else, you still have that identity that will keep you going. When things fail, you still have that identity that will keep you going. And that's what's been keeping me going. Um, and I think in the same sense, people have seen my passions. And when they, even I was leaving my job last year, they were encouraging me. My team was saying that go do it, we'll support you in that. Uh, the last thing I'll say, breathe. Most important thing in this life is your life. Everything else is replaceable. And with that, I'll say stay human or humane and be open to, to whatever is possible given the space that you have. So I'll stop here. Thank you. And I don't know if anyone will have any questions about this. Thank you so much, David. That is just mind-blowingly inspiring and so, so eloquent. Thank you so much. And all caps, thank you from Sophia. <laughs> I think I can agree with that. And applause from, from you as well. Um, 
if folks, if you have questions for David, um, please do put them in the chat and or in the agenda in the Google Doc. A little bit. Um, there are loads of comments flooding in on the Zoom chat. Very, very wonderful talk. Very engaging and passionate. Um, and not only for David, but all other speakers as well. If 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 no one has a question, I'll I'll take the <laughs> I'll take the chance. So so David, you mentioned that you know tr try and find one thing that um, you're known for and you're really good at. How do you identify that? From what I'll say, I think it starts with trying different things. Um, so it, it's part of that whole process of experiment, and I think it's so easy for us to based on people's opinion to think that if I'm gonna go into, let's say bioinformatics, this is the thing that I should do. I think the more you give you opportunity to experiment with different things, you realize what you're not good at, which is great. And then what, what are you good, good at? Um, also be open to, to feedback and build relationships with very close people who can tell you that, hey, you realize that you're very good at this. Um, and that feedback really helps you think about, I didn't realize that and you can own that. And so that is how I have discovered um, that I was told that I'm a very good listener. I tend not to talk so much. I just listen and then I will summarize what the person is telling me to a more coherent aspect. And then I realized that maybe I can take things that seem very complex and then turn that into accessible ways. And I think that's one of the things I specialize at. Thank you, David. Um, we have another question um, for you. Um, in a team where we are all the same in title or on paper and pigeonholed, how do we be individual? Um, I think in title, yes, you, you I, still, I still argue that there's something that's going to be different. So I'll take the, the, the aspect of data science. Even on a data science team, despite working on different things, there are people who have specific expertise or interests that, that are disparate. So I think in the same way, even if you have different titles, there are ways to really hone on specific things or understand the problem that you're trying to solve and really figure out ways that you can leverage on each other's skills. Um, that, that is really what I see. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give a specific answer. I think being able to identify other hobbies that you have, um, other things that you do outside work and seeing ways that you can bring that bring that in. Maybe you are the one who, when things seem stressful, you just laugh. <laughs> um, you can be that person, you are known for that, or you are the one who is considered too organized um, and you can be that same that person and all that comes together to um, highlight specializations that will allow you to, to thrive in, in specific circumstances. That'll be my, um, we had answer to that question. I hope hopefully it's, it's helpful. Thank you so much. Um, folks, if you want to take this chance to ask David, or in fact, um, some of our panelists who are still here as well, I think, um, please feel free to put it in the um, Google Doc or in the Zoom chat. There is one that is typing and it's for David and others who may be interested too. <laughs> Thank you, Mavika. So uh, Rachel, David and Ekin are still here. Hi, so I think I'm just gonna uh, talk, uh, mention my question. It's taking forever to type. Um, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, so I had a question about, um, there's a lot of encouragement in terms of, you know, diversifying your skill set and building secondary skills. Um, but how do you, so, and you know, you, when you have one job, you sort of specialize in one uh, skill and then you have a lot of other skills, of course. Um, when you maybe switch jobs, how do you sort of end up sort of specializing or 
advertising that secondary skill you had you know do you, do you understand the question I, I don't know it's very late for me I had a long day um yeah so for example uh right now let's say I'm a researcher but I want to go and work in I'm not a researcher but go work somewhere else and I'm just trying to sell it basically on this very small side skill that I have but then I would be competing maybe with someone who actually was very much specialized in that um yeah how would you sort of it's it's all transferable and I know it's transferable but how do you then sort of um cash in on your secondary skills uh, is, is it a sensible question I, I feel like it is but no phrase, phrase right I, I think you're very clear uh, I've just paraphrased your question on the chat Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I do think that's a very, I like to ask that too. <laughs> um, um, how do we do this? If you, um, Ekin, are you ready to give an answer? <laughs> Maybe start like that. That's a good question. <laughs> I guess it all depends on the job spec that you're applying to, right? <laughs> But then I think if you are going for something um, for a job which requires um, some sort of like big picture and um, and kind of like high level overview, then in a way um, they won't be looking for people who have been so specialized in that one skill, but they will be looking for someone who have previously shown interest uh, to be kind of like quite you know, multi-talented person and see this whole kind of bigger angle and wider approach. And they will be really keen on having someone who can um, show interest, put these different skills together uh, and, you know, use them to tackle a different problem. So I guess, yes, it all depends on the pool that you're competing with and everything. But I think as long as you go for jobs that look for like this kind of, um, Kind of wider perspective, then these secondary skills, although you might not have nurtured them uh, hugely, I think they will always become handy. And, you know, it will be up to you to kind of market them and sell them like during the interview or in your cover letter. But I would always say uh, just, you know, kind of try to sell it from this perspective. Like I might not have done this, I'm not, I might not have used this specific skill for the past 10 years of my life, but I you know, I've shown interest and I know how to use it when it's needed. Um, does that make sense more or less or is it too abstract? <laughs> it makes sense. Can I check in a little bit? That's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah, um, adding to what I can say, um, I, I think there the are different approaches. So with regards to jobs, sometimes startups are quite helpful um, in this kind of trans transition because usually when they do start up, they are looking for generalists to help with all the different things happening. Um, they usually require threshold skills, fundamental skills that everybody on the team, we understand the problem you're trying to solve, we understand how startups work. And then as they grow, then you start specializing, right? So they tend to be great environments if you are kind of not necessarily a specialist, but one to go into one to be in. Um, the second thing that I really say is, um, going back to the relation to the startup, for me, I find the most interesting companies to work in are not those who are looking for um, specific technical skills all the time, or do you know this too, or do you have this technical skill, but do you have the ability um, to learn these skills, right? So I think in when you're applying to these things, demonstrating that you are that person who is able to take any problem, is able to learn the skills that are required to become the person who can solve the best person to solve that problem is the most vital thing. There are some organizations who will say, no, we will still want to see somebody who's done the previous work. Sometimes I think that that is some of the least ideal places to work because then it means that you always be boxed into a specific um, aspect. And I tend to go for organizations that believe that people have fundamental skills and an ability to learn. So um, that is the thing that I'll say. And 
I think in, in the meantime, before you make that switch, volunteering on other things. So for, for instance, I um, volunteer to help other companies with things that are not necessarily related to my role. I vol uh, volunteer in my high school, really mentoring people. And I think all those become relevant and can actually make you much more of a specialist at something when, when the time comes. So that's what I'll add to it. Thank you so much, David. Um, Rachel? Um, yeah, David pretty much hit the nail on the head with with all of that. Um, I definitely recommend um, if you have time vol volunteering just to just to make sure that you do uh, want to kind of pursue that direction and and get that context and experience. And I also think that that demonstrates that you're you're passionate about something. So if you're applying for for a job um, that maybe you didn't have previous, you know, um, professional experience, and if you show that you know you've done it. In your spare time, then I think that also um, will resonate a lot with with who you're applying to. But I think it's also important to also keep in mind that you know not everybody has uh, the spare time to do that sort of stuff. So don't put too much extra pressure on yourself. But um, I think just demonstrating your passion for for that thing that you want to switch into, I think, is is really vital and important. Um, and kind of adding any kind of context. So. For me, um, even though I didn't have previous um, experience with a community manager title, um, I came from uh, the community that I would be community managing. So I had um, the context of the people that I was going to be working with. Um, I shared their experiences. And then I had um, a lot of that kind of volunteerish experience um, doing that community management. And that's that was very helpful, I think. Thank you so much, Rachel. Yeah, I can totally agree with that. <laughs> um, and, and of course, every, uh, all the things that uh, all of our uh, speakers talked about. Um, do we have time for more? Wait, let me just quickly check the... I think we'll have to move on, Amy. Okay. Um, thank you so much for all, to all our panelists and for your questions. Um, yeah, I will hand it over to Malika. And I'll hand it to you. We have a short reflection exercise that she'll lead. Okay, okay. Uh, so, folks, um, if you scroll almost to the bottom of the Google Doc, uh, we have uh, the reflection exercise. It says sustaining, and we have three question prompts. Uh, so this will just be uh, let's mute and um, for three or four minutes and see, ha have a think. You can answer these privately if you don't feel like you want to share these because these are personal with regards to careers related things. But if you are happy to share them, then please do. Uh, so the three questions are what brought you to your work and to open leadership? Uh, so what, what feelings or motivation made you think about this? What would you need to maintain that feeling uh, or the motivation for another five years? Um, and what would you need to keep doing that for the rest of your career? And again, you can just write this privately if you'd rather not share this because we recognize that it could be personal. Uh, but it's just a short reflection exercise. Um, and then when we have two or three minutes left, um, if anyone wants to share anything that they've thought um, in response to that, we'll share that. And then we'll wrap up roughly on time. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to stick myself on mute while we type a bit. All clear? Okay, I've got thumbs up. Awesome.
Okay, we have, uh, keep typing. We have about three minutes left on the clock officially. Um, I too had noticed we have multiple fundings coming into prompt two, which is a realistic and reasonable response to, yeah, I would love to keep doing what I'm doing, but someone's got to pay me for it. <laughs> um, does anyone want to unmute to share any of the reflections that they've had? You know, I'm not afraid to leave awkward silences. Okie dokie, yeah, keep keep this writing in. Um, I just wanted to just about plus one every single, like I went through plus one, yes, I totally agree with this. And then I went to another one, I was like, wait, I'm just gonna spend the whole time going to every bullet point and plus one but I'm loving all of the motivation we have here talking about like sharing and collaborating. Um, so there's some really lovely and exciting energy. Um, keep, keep it streaming in. Uh, so I think we will wrap up the call. Uh, so we have uh, next week a pub quiz. We haven't set the time because we only just decided to do a pub quiz like a couple of days ago. Um, but we thought it might be a nice way to just have a, a casual social call rather than something that's really targeted and learning. -y. Um, so we will send out the details for the pub quiz for everyone. If you're a mentor, you may be familiar with some of the questions from last round, but we will update it a little bit. Um, and we have set graduation dates. So if uh, you take a look at the bottom of the doc. We have links to three sets of notes with the time zones and a link to when it is in your time zone. Uh, and you can already hop onto those links and sign up to whichever slot is uh, for you, uh, whichever slot suits you best. And if you find that all 10 of the slots are taken up, please let us know and we can probably be flexible and figure out how to uh, find some more time for you. Um, as usual, also at the very end of the doc, we have a feedback. So if you want to share anything that didn't work or did work, then um, or anything that you changed or anything that surprised you, then feel free to leave that. You can leave it anonymously and we won't know or you can leave your name. Either is fine. And we do know that the otter didn't work, uh, but you can share more about that if you wish. <laughs> um, Malvika or Emmy, anything to add? I was just gonna say, uh, we'll hang out for another 10 minutes, uh, but it's an official wrap up for people who need to be somewhere else. Uh, thank you for joining and especially thanks to all the speakers. Um, it was very inspiring. Yeah, so thank you so much to everyone who's come along. And like Mavika said, thank you for the speakers. Um, have a great evening, day, morning, night as it works for you. It's been lovely. Uh, Joyce, the um, the documents, actually, the, the, the links to our three documents or the ones that Malvika's just posted, you can actually just add your project into one of the 10 slots in each of those documents. Oh, OK, thank you. I'm a little slow right now. It's late. <laughs> we're, we're feeling, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, please do put your name in the roll call. There should be slots for 10 different people and you can put your name in the roll call. Yo, can you stop recording maybe? I suppose so. I will do. Um, I'm trying to...